Chapter four, cell structure and function. <clears throat> if you look here, you see a, an uh, fluorescent cell uh, right there, darkly stained in the center will be the nucleus of that cell, which is the control center of the cell. And then you can see the network of the cell all around it. So this is a pretty fascinating chapter. Um, this topic of cell biology, cellular biology, um, really took off with the discovery of the microscope, especially those more advanced microscopes, which we'll look at as we begin this chapter. So the importance of cells. Cytology is the study of cells. Cyto is the prefix that means cells. And then you have logy, which is the study of. So cytology is the study of cells. And the human body has about 100 trillion cells altogether. And we'll look at what makes those cells unique from one another. All organisms are made up of cells. And the cell is the simplest collection of matter that can live. So truly, it is right here where we begin uh, life the level at which life begins, the cellular level. Cell structure is correlated to cellular function. So the cell is designed, the cell's design is related to its function at the cellular level. So for example, we have cardiac cells that make up the heart. We have muscle cells that have a certain job. We have epithelial cells that serve as linings, such as our skin, nerve cells, which all carry out certain functions. So cell structure is correlated to its function and all cells are related from their de uh, descendants, and those earlier cells are what we call stem cells. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to hit upon some very important topics of biology, um, and then continue on with some of those important topics as we start to get really in-depth with our cellular studies, and we'll look at things such as stel uh, stem, stem cell research, cancer biology, so on and so forth. So microscopes and cells. Without the microscopes, we would not know what we know today about cells and their physiology. Though usually too small to be seen by the unaided eye, cells can be very complex. We will look at both the simplest cell types, that of a prokaryotic cell, and then we'll look at more complex cells of the eukaryotic cell the organism. Cellular biology became a reality with the introduction of the microscope, and the microscope in the 1600s was first developed by a gentleman by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Um, his first microscope was very simple. It looked uh, very similar to that of a hand lens, and he was the first person to view and describe uh, protozoa and bacteria using a microscope. So technically, he could go down in history as the first person to observe living cells. But at that time, he did not know what cells were. If you look, here is a picture of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, and here is his simple microscope. So microscopy, um, in class, we use the light microscope, and visible light passes through the specimen, the tissue sample, or whatever you have on, on the slide, and then through the glass lenses, which magnify the image. The minimum resolution of a light microscope is about 200 nanometers, which is about the size of a small bacterium. So if you look here, here is, uh, if you look at the chart, you see 10 micrometers. You have about, um, between 10 and 1 micrometer, you have the nucleus, most bacteria, and the mitochondria. Between 10 and 100 micrometers, you have most plant and animal cells. So the light microscope, you see its uh, visibility. And then you could see what we could see with the unaided eye. You could see a frog egg, a chicken egg, on um, the length of some nerve and muscle cells. Uh, and then you could also see the, the uh, uh, height of a human as they fall on there. But most of our, our understanding of cells and their, their uh, intricate cell parts, their, their cell structures, have come about with the use of the electron microscope. So light microscopes can magnify effectively, effectively to about 1,000 times the actual size of the specimen, like our microscopes we use in lab. And various techniques can be used to enhance the contrast and enable the cell components to be stained or labeled. But most subcellular structures or organelles are too small to be resolved by a light microscope. So some techniques that you could use are the bright field unstained specimen versus a bright field stained specimen. You could do phase contrasting. You could do differential interference contrast. Uh, you could do the fluorescent microscope. And if you look at that image there, that's very similar to the one on the picture that starts this lecture. 
and then there's the confocal contrast. But it is the electron microscope that has really brought about uh, the advances of cellular biology. And there are two basic electron microscopes, abbreviated EM, that are used to study subcellular structures. You have the scanning electron microscope, a SEM microscope, or you have the transmission electron microscope, which is a TEM microscope. The scanning electron microscope focuses a beam of electrons onto the surface of the specimen and it creates a 3D image called an electron micrograph. So this would be uh, an external uh, image of what that particular specimen would look like. If you want to look inside the specimen, you want to use a transmission electron microscope and it because it will focus a beam of electrons through the specimen. Transmission electron microscopes are used mainly to study the internal ultrastructure of cells. And if you look here, you can see um, that the top part there is a scanning electron microscope, an SEM, and there you can see the cilia, which are little hairs, um, some used for attachment, some used for locomotion. So you can see the cilia of a cell there. Uh, that would be an external structure. That's why you'd use the scanning electron microscope. If you look at a cross section of the cilium itself, or a long longitudinal section of cilium at one micrometer, that there you would need the transmission electron microscope because it's an internal view. So the up, upper portion is the SEM mi electron micrograph, and the bottom picture, B, is the TEM micro electron micrograph. And you can see how one gives that surface view, the other gives the internal view of the organism. Cell fractionation is another important technique that cell biologists use to separate cell structures from one another. Ultracentrifugation uh, fractionates cells into their components. So if you think of a centrifuge, it spins something very fast, and then you start to separate the components of that mixture uh, according to its densities. So separating the components of cells allows biologists to study functions of organelles. So here you can see a, a homogenization technique. You add that to the centrifuge and you spin it and then you get the, there you can see the tissue sample to the left. And then after homogenization, you get this homogeny and you can see all the individual cell particles there in the, the test tube. So what you could then, then do is uh, you could, uh, after spinning it, you could take the pellet and that would be the stuff that's densest and it's at the bottom there and you could add the supernatant port in the next test tube and, and spin it and keep adding it and then separate the components of that uh, based on time wise so there you go from 10 minutes to 20 minutes 60 minutes to three hours and then you could take those pellets out and examine them so in the first part there you have a pellet rich in nucle nuclei and cellular debris in the second one you have pellets that are rich in mitochondria and chloroplast if cells are are from a plant in the third there, you have a pellet that is rich in microsomes, which are pieces of the plasma membrane and cell internal membranes. And then at the bottom, you have a pellet rich in ribosomes. So cell biology, um, in 1665 to 1723, there was this English scientist by the name of Robert Hooke. And he is the scientist that is, uh, went down in biology book history as coining the term cell. And what he did was, if you look in the right picture, or the left picture there, uh, he examined cork under the microscope. And uh, he lived in a monastery, and when he was looking at the cork under the microscope, the way the cork cells were oriented in the cork tissue, it reminded him the way the cell blocks were arranged in the uh, living quarters at the church. And at the time they called those living quarters the cells and when he looked at that and, and this cork tissue reminded him of cells he said well here we have a tissue sample here and the tissue sample is composed of these these little things that he called cells so Robert Hooke did go down as coining the term cells and it's still used today in biology so the cell was largely uncharted until the 1950s again think about the time frame of other sci sciences like chemistry and physics and, and biology, and biology is truly a young science, especially when you're looking at uh, the introduction of the electron microscope and its advancement to cellular biology from the 1950s on, and how much we have advanced since then. So that's when many advances in cell biology began, and ultracentrifuges allowed for cell fractionation to take place. 
So we know today that all living things are made of cells. And this is a fundamental theory of biology, the cellular theory. It was the observations of von Leeuwenhoek and Hooke that sparked interest in the cells. But a trio of German scientists made conclusions which eventually led to the development of the cell theory. In 1838, you have a Germ German botanist by Matthias Schleiden, and he uh, was studying plants, being a botanist, and he looked at plant tissues, and he said that all plants are composed of cells. In 1839, German zoologist Theodor Schwann uh, was looking at animal tissue under the microscope, and he saw that all animals are made of cells. And then in 1855, a uh, physician, Rudolf Virchow, he uh, was looking at um, the cells and he said that all cells come from pre-existing cells and we'll look at cell division later on in the course. So with the help of, of these scientists and, and others that were studying, we had the development of the cell theory and that theory has three basic parts. The first part is that all living things are composed of one or more cells. The second statement of the th cell theory is that cells are the basic units of structure and function in all organisms. And then the third part there would be cells only come from the reproduction of pre-existing cells. And here you can see cell diversity. So we start off ultimately in humans, we look at the human egg from a stem cell, and then that stem cell can differentiate into the many other uh, trillions of cells that are found in the human body, whether it be an astrocyte, a nerve cell, red blood cell, white blood cell, epithelial cell, uh, so on and so forth. So cell internalization, when we talk about cell structures, we often refer to them as organelles, which are little compartment or little houses, and it is a cell component that performs a specific function for the cell. So a good thing here, uh, as we go through our cell structure function chapter, is to think of the cell as a factory, and each little component of that cell, the cell structure or organelle, has its specific job, just as each part of a factory has a certain part of that manufacturing process. So many cells share common structures. We are going to look at these structures throughout the, our studies, but we'll begin our cellular tour by looking at the difference between the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. And the basic difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote is that the basic structural and functional unit of every organism is one of two cell types, either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. If you are an organism that belongs to domain bacteria or domain archaea, you are consisted of prokaryotic cells. These are simple cell types, probably the first cell types on our planet, uh, that of archaea prokaryotic cell types. So those two domains, with each with their own kingdom, are prokaryotic cell types. And then we have the domain Eukara, which consists of the kingdom Protista, Fungi, Animalia, and Plantae. Those are all organisms that consist of the eukaryotic cell. So if we look at the basic features of all cells, whether prokaryotic or eukaryotic, all cells have a plasma membrane. All cells have a semi-fluid substance called the cytosol, which the cell structures are suspended in. All cells have chromosomes, which carry the genes, which is uh, the genetic information there of DNA. And all cells have ribosomes, which are needed to make proteins. In the last chapter in biochemistry, we studied the many diverse functions of, of proteins and what they do for living organisms. The biggest difference is prokaryotic cells have no nuclei. And in the prokaryotic cell, the DNA is in an unbound region called the nucleoid. So prokaryotic cells lack nuclei. The eukaryotic cell has a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells also lack membrane-bound organelles, and we'll talk about membrane-bound organelles as we get uh, further into the chapter. And that is all for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and we'll continue with the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell later.